to the brief lunch break. I hope you enjoyed the break and uh, you just managed to stretch your legs. We are actually transitioning to the last and final panel discussion today, uh, which is going to be a very interesting one. And I would like to invite you to listen to that carefully and pose your questions. You know, there will be, the ladies will be here and you will be open to questions after we uh, complete this um, discussion. But I would just like to give the floor now to my uh, esteemed fellow colleague, Katerina Badzaki. Catherine, the floor is yours. Hello, and welcome to this very important uh, conference here about women, about how important women are in society, because we have a dual rule that we need to cover. I'm a journalist, I work for ERT, for Hellenic broadcaster ERT, and I would like to ask from you, uh, to give you the possibility, I want to talk to you about four minutes, about what I think is very important, about some research that I have done on the topic. Now, um, we know that women, especially working mothers and caregivers, we know that they have historically been the primary seekers of accommodation and have faced pay and career discrimination as a result. Um, although a smaller number of men seek similar arrangements and may also face discrimination, they are all more likely to advance in their careers, as we all know. Work-life flexibility has long been also gender uh, silent, seen as a women's issue, with women bearing the brunt of its effects on career and pay across occupations. So this was especially true, and we've seen that during the pandemic. For example, um, the publishing output and productivity of talented uh, STEM professional women decreased dramatically, while women handled most of the childcare elder care and schooling in those days. And we know that great strides have been made in the workplace for women, but we also know that there is still much more to be done in terms of bringing more gender balance to the sea levels and into the boardrooms. Now, um, studies show a significant gap in the number of female leaders. Um, for example, just 14.2% of the top five leadership positions of top-notch investment companies, such as, for example, Standard & Poor's and other companies like that, are held by women. At the same time, women-led companies are shown to perform better than those led by men, up to three times better, according to one study. And clearly, clearly putting more women in leadership roles should be a given, but that, as we all know, isn't always the case. So thankfully, the advent of social media and other online tools has helped usher in a fourth wave of feminism that, among other things, has instigated more and more conversation about gender equality in the workplace. Now, there are countless academics, activists, some of you are already here today to honor this day, and even celebrities explaining why a group that makes up slightly more than half of the global population and that earns more than 60% of the world's undergraduate and master's degrees is still underrepresented in business. From my perspective, though, I encountered head-on what I believe is one of the many hurdles that women face. We are taught to be happy in supporting roles, and we often off-ramp and exit the career superhighway to care for children, parents, and even spouses. So even those who keep their nose to the grindstone often experience a slower career progression than their male colleagues. And why is that? Because the reality is that women are more often than not the main person balancing work responsibilities with home and family duties. So this juggling act becomes increasingly more difficult, and at some point a woman's career becomes less important than the quality of her own and her family life. So in a nutshell, business outcomes are superior when women are part of the executive and board ranks. And what's more, on a soft skills level, women also bring a mindset of flexibility as leaders. This comes from the fact that women are more likely than men to have been in situations requiring flexibility, which means that they are more likely to institute the kind of flexible work policies shown to be highly effective in retaining talent and building uh, royalty. And while it goes without saying that um, e evening out the gender pay gap, redefining our notion of flexible working hours and providing management training that looks to support gender equality are non-negotiable, 
There are also smaller, simpler steps that each one of us can take. Those steps I will um, give the flow to my valued um, uh, guests here today to give us their view of what it's like to be able to uh, keep that fragile balance. But before I do that, um, I think it is worthwhile to see the valuable contribution of Minister of Social Cohesion and Family Affairs, Ms. Sofia Zaharaki, about how mother, when she knows that her family and children are well taken care of, she feels safe and why empowering the choices, increasing and improved work balance, and at the same time increasing labor participation, also empowering young women, is a state affair. So we'll give, um, bear with us for a few minutes, it's very important to see her speech and understand more about why we are here today and why our presence matters. Dear friends, esteemed speakers and guests, I would like to begin by thanking the Women Economic Forum Greece for creating a space where impactful conversations and inspired connections can thrive. I would also like to extend my heartfelt congratulations to all those distinguished women leaders in the business community that are gathered there today. You know that your achievements not only empower us, but they're a beacon of inspiration for countless other women to follow the entrepreneurial vision. And here at the Ministry of Social Cohesion and Family, we are trying really to prioritize women's empowerment while at the same time implementing measures for work-life balance. Because we do feel, and we actually state very clearly, that there shouldn't be a dilemma. There should be a choice. And this reinforcement of choice is something that the Prime Minister himself and the competent ministers are trying to make very clear inside our legislation, extending the maternity leave, making sure that the father also gets some months off when, after having the baby, while at the same time increasing leave days that we can actually take in the private sector, thus correcting an injustice that has been going on for many, many years. We have really increased all the budget in order to offer better, more secure, more meticulously planned childcare. And at the same time, we're really doing our best alongside the municipalities and the regions to really amplify the impact of social policies that matter. Because in order for a woman to be able to succeed in their daily life and their achievements in work, she really has to feel safe and secure that the child, the family, is well taken care of. At the same time, we are really trying to empower younger women by also implementing measures and legislation that has really put Greece at the position of being one of the 12 countries to offer full equality status in all the legislation. Are we there yet? Of course not. But in the past years, we have seen achievements. We have seen more women working. We have seen more women in leadership roles. And just in two months from now, we will also transposite a very important regulation that really increases the role of women in listed companies in board of directors. And what is more, and what is more to do in 2025, is to implement more seminars, workshops, increase and amplify the use of the equality seal in all businesses, try to change the mindset, and of course abolish the prejudice that is still there in our community. So a whole spectrum of policies that empower women, empower their choices, increase and improve work-life balance, and at the same time, increase labor participation for women, really empowering younger women, is at the very heart of our effort here at the Ministry of Social Cohesion and Family Affairs. Another spectrum that is very dear and important to us is social economy. Because you know, dear friends, that in many areas around Greece, there are fewer opportunities for investment, and social economy and social entrepreneurship can really make a difference. I would very much like to receive the very important takeaways from this important meeting and to make sure that we actually make, make them into policies. And this is what we're going to do here alongside my Deputy Minister, Ms. Papacosta, the Secretary Generals, and all the people behind this effort of the newly established ministry. Again, my warm felt congratulations and, and commitment 
to see all the policies be implemented here in Greece. So we heard the valued contribution by Minister of Social Cohesion, uh, Ms. Haragia. Well, uh, the, the question is, though, how do we balance career with family life and remain an equal partner in the workforce? Um, I guess today, Biki Bafataki is a dedicated research associate uh, in the University of Athens, where she focuses on advancing interdisciplinary uh, studies and bioethics and fostering academic collaboration. In addition to her research role, she serves as a general secretary of the International uh, SCAC Awards, an initiative that recognizes excellence in various fields of science and culture. And she's also committed to promote, promoting innovative ideas and supporting emerging talents in academia, um, contributing significantly to both her institution and the broader scientific community. Now, her work emphasizes the importance of cross-cultural dialogue and the impact of research on societal development. And by that, I pass the flow to you, Ms. Bahadaki. Tell us about this very fragile balance between family and uh, career, and to also tell us how many of those emerging talents you support in academia are women, and are they more or less uh, in recent years? It's Thank difficult, you. but uh, I want to talk uh, about this topic. The role of women in balancing career and family, empowering them to assume leadership position and maximizing their influence in shaping the next generation economy. Women have long faced uh, the dual challenge of uh, persuading these careers aspiration while fulfilling family responsibilities. Although progress has been made, this balancing act remains complex. Yes, it is through addressing these challenges that we can unlock immense potential for individuals, families, and society as a whole. The balancing of career and family responsibilities is not just a personal challenge. It is a societal one. Women who wish to pursue their professional goals while raising families require adaptive strategies and, crucially, societal support. This includes more flexible work policies, parental leave options, and access to affordable childcare. By creating structures that facilitate work-life balance, we enable women to thrive both at home and in their careers. For example, countries with progressive maternity and paternity leave policies tend to have higher female workforce, participation, and lower gender gaps in leadership roles. Leadership is another crucial area where women are underrepresented despite their capabilities. Many talented women are often constrained by systemic barriers, social expectation, or lack of opportunity. But we know that gender diverse leadership teams drive better decision making, innovation, and pro profitability. Study shows that companies with more women in ex executive positions perform better financially. Empowering women to pursue leadership roles through mentoring, education, and break down structural barriers unleashes their full potential, benefiting not just businesses, but society at large. The cultural narrative and around women in leadership has started to shift and films like Joy with uh, Jennifer Lawrence and The Inter with Anne Hathaway highlight the complexity and strength required for women to balance these dual demands. Enjoy. Uh, we can see the trailer, please. Ah, the inter. Okay, the inter. The inter also. Boys? Shall we just. Can we just rewind it, please? Just to have a look at it again. The inter explores the complexities so. of modern womanhood through the character of Jules Austin, a successful. CEO trying to balance her company and her family life. Her story reflects 
The pressures many women face navigating leadership responsibilities while trying to live up to traditional family expectation. Through both characters, this film humanizes the daily struggles and triumphs of women striving to maintain a successful career and a meaningful family life. Can we just see the video again, please? Can we just... Can we have a look at the video again, please? The joy, is that right? No, no, the, the, inter. the inter. The inter. With sound. Thank you. Seasoned CEO one. could take no. some things off your plate. Let me give me CEO lessons. I never had anything like this in my life. This big, beautiful, exciting thing that you created. Remember who did that? Who? Oh. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> it's moments like this when you need someone you know you can count on. Because you're my... Intern. Well, I was gonna say intern slash best friend. Look and learn, boys, because this is what cool is. How in one generation have men gone from guys like Jack Nicholson and Harrison Ford to... Oh, boy. Joey Mangano, who invents a product that... Um, revolutionizes uh, house, household cleaning, the miracle mop. Despite the personal and professional setbacks, she defies expectation, proving that women can innovate and lead even while managing family responsibilities. This portrait reflects the tenacity and uh, resilience of women balancing multiple roles and highlights how their unique life experience can lead to breakthroughs in business. Μπορείτε να βάλετε το Joy. Μπορούμε λίγο να βούμε το trailer του Joy. I want you to remember something. Because a lot of times people get nice things and they start to think differently. We got here from hard work, patience and humility. So I want to tell you, don't ever think that the world owes you anything, because it doesn't. The world doesn't owe you a thing. I was valedictorian in high school. I got into a fancy college. I stay in here because my parents are getting divorced. No! You know what you are, Terry? You're like a gas leak. We don't see you, we don't smell you, but you're silently killing us all. Maybe your dreams are on hold for now. That's a nice way of putting it. One day. You could have married anybody. You could have married a doctor, a lawyer, a nice man, instead of this. I don't even know what to call this guy. Are you seriously talking about this right now? I believe the ordinary meets the extraordinary every single day. I have real ambitions and real ideas. We're making an invention, and it's very serious. Joy's never run a business in her entire life. It's my fault. I gave her the confidence to think she was more than just an unemployed housewife. I don't want to end up like my family. I have to do things myself once and for all. Okay, Godspeed, good luck, here we go. As you grow up and come into the world that has all sorts of things in it, money, crime, betrayal, seems like you're shaking us down. You can pay more. I can't, and I won't. And you realize that the only thing you're gonna have is what you make. You are in a room, and there is a gun on the table. I want my life to be the other person in the room is an adversary in commerce. Only one of you can prevail. Do you pick up the gun, Troy? I pick up the gun. Listen to me. Never speak on my behalf about my business. Again. To love somebody, to love somebody, the way I love you.
Thank you. Now moving from culture to economy, we must recognize that women's full participation in the workforce is not just a matter of fairness, but a necessity for economic growth. The more inclusive the economy, the more thrives. Studies show that closing the gender gap in the workforce could add trillions to the global economy. Women's contribution in shaping, in shaping the next generation economy are vital, especially as we move towards a more diverse and uh, intercontinent world. Women are key drivers of innovation and their leadership styles bring collaboration, empathy, and religion to, to organizations. When women are empowered to take on leadership position, they help cultivate more inclusive workplace cultures and bring new perspectives to problem solving. This ripple effect not only benefits businesses, but society at large by creating role models for the next generation, inspiring both girls and boys to see leadership as an opportunity available to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mofataki, for this very uh, rewarding speech and also giving us the opportunity to see these uh, two very important films I've never seen actually before. They, there are they... many films about this topic. Yes. There are many films about this topic. I will, I will keep the, the line by Jennifer Lawrence saying yes. that, uh, you know, never talk about my business without yes. my permission. So I guess that's the key into understanding how important, you know, our uh, role and um, our uh, value is when we actually start up something which is ours and we want to keep it ours. Um, there have been a few very important firsts, uh, especially when it comes to our judicial system and to the fact that um, in the past few decades we had only very few women actually rising that ladder um, in these top very important positions. Um, and I'm very happy here to welcome uh, Ms. Pirdula Hrisikopoulou, who is a prominent legal scholar and public official, currently serving as Vice President of the Hellenic Council of State, Greece's highest administrative court. Uh, with a strong background in administrative law and constitutional law, she has contributed significantly to legal scholarship and public administration. And she has been involved in various legal reforms and also has played a vital role in shaping judicial processes in Greece. Her expertise is recognized both nationally and internationally, and she's known for her commitment to upholding the rule of law and promoting justice within the public uh, sector. So um, we um, know that the role of women judges in our judicial system has been quite limited in the past few years, but thanks to people like Ms. Krishopoglu, um, this has started to change. Thank you very much for being with us today Thank and you. giving us the opportunity to learn more from you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and uh, honored guests, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on, women, on, the, on the women judges. Um, and especially thank you, uh, you Mrs. Uh, Antonia Moropoulou, for the invitation. Uh, the role of women judges in our judicial system and the prospects of their careers in the legal profession is an important and pressing topic very relevant to our discussion today. As we meet here, it is essential to recognize the strides we have made in the last 15 years or so towards gender equality in the judiciary, while also acknowledging the challenges that still lie ahead. Today, women hold various positions within our courts, from magistrates, to Supreme Court justices. We can observe a greater number of women in the judicial system overall, even achieving positions of precedence in the Court of Cassation 
and the Supreme Administrative Court. This development is not merely a matter of statistics. It marks progress and signifies a shift towards a more inclusive and equitable legal system, showing that the representation of women in the judiciary has significantly improved over the past few decades. Despite the evidence of there being a majority of women in the judiciary, this has not led to equality in the decision-making process when considering candidates for advanced positions of authority, such as vice presidency or presidency. For selection to these most senior posts, it is still in the hands of the male-dominated government to choose the successful candidate. Here, I offer a brief summary of the recent success of women in the courts of Greece. 2011 was a significant year for women in the arena of justice. As mentioned, there was a majority of females holding positions as magistrates and judges working in certain levels of the lower courts, but never getting the opportunity to distinguish themselves in senior levels of the judicial hierarchy. Until that time, there had been a male-dominated selection process for the position of president of the Court of Cassation, Arios Pagos, which meant that leadership in the court was always a male privilege. But in 2011, we saw the winds of change slowly blow in when Irina Simakopoulou became the first female president of the Court of Cassation in Greece. In 2013, we saw the election of the first female prosecutor of the court of Cassation, Efterpi Gujamani. In 2015, Androniki Theotokatu became the first female president of the Hellenic Court of Audit, Elenktiko Sinedrio. This was followed in, 19, in 2018 by the selection of Katerina Sakelaropoulou to the post of President of the Supreme Administrative Court, Council of State, Symbolio Tis Epicratias, Ste, the first woman to ever hold this honor. Mrs. Sakelaropoulou later became the first female president of the Hellenic Republic, a title she holds today. All these successful women had gone through a selection procedure with final choices made by the government where male domination was apparent. Finally, through the appointment of these women, we can observe the recognition of the particular and unique abilities and skills that women bring to the table. Women judges contribute a diverse range of perspectives and experiences, enriching the decision-making process and fostering a, a more holistic understanding of justice. However, despite these achievements, challenges persist. An example of this is the lack of inclusion of women in the selection committees. Thus, the glass ceiling still exists for female justices holding positions on the selection committees when choosing the highest judiciary placements. Women judges often encounter obstacles such as gender bias, workplace discrimination, and the lack of mentorship opportunities. These barriers can hinder their professional growth and limit their prospects for advancement within the judiciary. It is essential for us to address these challenges hand on, creating a supportive environment that allows women to thrive in their legal careers. First, mentorship and networking. Establishing dynamic mentorship programs which connect aspiring female judges with experienced women in the field is, crit is critical. 
networking opportunities can foster relationships that offer guidance, support, and career advancement. Sadly, a negative aspect of large numbers of women in the lower justice system can lead to antagonism, petty jealousies, and thus hostility within their own gender. Second, professional development and training. Continuous education and training opportunities tailored for women in the judiciary will equip them with the necessary skills to navigate the complexities of the legal system and enhance their leadership capabilities. Third, promoting work-life balance. Recognizing the unique challenges faced by women, especially those juggling family responsibilities, is crucial. On completion of the National School of Judiciary, successful graduates are then selected dependent on their scores and personal preferences. In their chosen area, they are given the opportunity for practical experience and guidance from senior colleagues, thus leading to further advancement over the years. This progression is frequently disturbed due to personal commitments and relationships in the women's lives, marriage and family. Flexible work arrangements and family-friendly policies will empower women to excel both professionally and personally. In the lower judiciary positions, this is evident, where women colleagues are fortunate enough to be able to continue their professional life with a home work-based program. It is possible for them to spend more time working from home on preparation for cases with fewer days spent in the courts. Fourth, advocacy and awareness. It is vital to raise awareness of, of the contributions of women judges and to advocate for equal offer opportunities in the leadership of the judiciary. By showcasing successful women within the legal profession, we can inspire the next generation of female legal leaders. Fifth, forming alliances. Collaborating with organizations that promote gender equality in the judiciary can provide invaluable resources and support in driving change within our legal systems. The prospects for women in the judiciary are promising, but they require our collective effort and commitment to create a harmonious and to equitable environment. By investing in the develop development of women judges, we are not merely promoting gender equality. We are ensuring that justice is served through diverse perspectives and inclusive representation. In closing, let us reaffirm our commitment to empowering women in the judicial system, recognizing that a more diverse judiciary leads to a more just society. Together, we can pave the way for generations of women judges, ensuring their voices are heard, their role upgraded, and their contributions celebrated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skopoulou. I think it's very important to understand that uh, it's very important to have to ensure that the voices uh, of women are heard, as you well said, and also they're all upgraded, and also that there's a more diverse judiciary yes. that will bring us a step forward towards that direction. Thank you very much for that. Um, in our company today, and uh, the third lady in the flow, right next to me, um, is Miss Sophia. We didn't get the chance to, to meet before that. That's yes, 
Lambropoulou. Miss Sophia Lambropoulou, oh, sorry, right. And um, Miss, Mrs. Lambropoulou is a professor at the National Technical uh, University of Athens uh, in the School of Applied Mathematical and Physical Sciences. She's recognized for expertise in mathematical sciences and her dedication to education and research. In addition to her academic role, um, Mrs. Lebrupoul serves as the president of the National Technical University of Athens Committee for Gender Equality and Discrimination Prevention, where she advocates for gender equity and inclusivity within the university environment. Her leadership in this committee highlights her commitment to fostering a supportive an equitable academic community, uh, promoting initiatives that address gender disparities in education and research. And by that, allow me, Mrs. Lavrapoulou, to ask you a question and just passing you the flow by asking you, is gender equity and, ex and inclusivity still an issue within the university environment, given that younger generations have become more adaptive to embracing diversity because they seem to be growing up with it? Thank you. Thank you for this very honoring invitation, for giving me the opportunity to, um, to present some thoughts in front of this uh, uh, excellent audience. Uh, well, uh, uh, I will talk to you about the world of mathematics and mathematicians. So, uh, how was the position of women, uh, especially Greek women, and how it develops to nowadays? Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 subst the, the main issue throughout the years is this career versus family issue. I remember 1990 or 91 in London, uh, there was a great uh, woman mathematician from the States uh, Dusa Macduff, the wife of John Milner, the famous mathematician, who organized, uh, co organized uh, the first meeting in England, in Europe in generally, uh, where only women were invited. I was invited speaker as a young researcher at the time. And uh, that was the beginning of the Association European Women in Mathematics. So it was only so recent. In, uh, in the States, they had done uh, much more work on the issue in previous years, like uh, with um, Elena Rudin, with Karen Nullenbeck, uh, and so on, and historical figures uh, like um, Emmy Netter, who was a Hebrew, uh, uh, a Jewish mathematician in Germany, who had to flee Germany during the Se Second World War, and uh, who uh, famous mathematician Hilbert, uh, wanted to give her a position. She was an amazing, uh, I mean, there is a lot of algebra, I know Ethereum rings after her name, and uh, uh, Hilbert wanted to, to find a position for her, and uh, the university council <coughs> refused, so she was unpaid, and uh, the argument was that she was only a woman, and Hilbert said that uh, she is not asking for, we are not asking for a job for her in uh, public baths. It is at the university that uh, we, are, we want to employ her. So, uh, so we have uh, um, an um, awareness, a rising awareness uh, throughout Europe about the position of women, uh, especially versus family and in the field of mathematics. Let me tell you that uh, these societal discriminations that uh, women, uh, I mean, came from uh, root, of course, from ancient times, uh, were uh, uh, women thinking differently, thinking more practically, thinking more like men, were considered cast out because mathematics is a field really more, much more male dominated than uh, others. So uh, I, want to, I want to mention uh, Ethra, who was the mother of Theseus uh, in Trizina, who taught arithmetics, Themistoclea, uh, a woman uh, who uh, taught um, uh, Plato, uh, and uh, Theanothuria, who taught number theory in Croton, the school of Pythagoras, and other women like Lasithia, who visited Plato's Academy dressed in men's clothing. And um, 
Then we arrive uh, gradually to Hellenistic uh, period in Alexandria, uh, like, like uh, about 500 AD, where Ipatia, the famous Greek woman Ipatia, mathematician, the daughter of Theon, uh, who was a mathematician and taught her mathematics, she made her own school, uh, but made no family. And uh, also she found tragic death uh, by... Um, by uh, people, uh, how to say, by a crowd, let's say, by infuriated crowd uh, um, based on realistic ideas, uh, on, uh, sorry, theological ideas. Anyhow, so then in recent years, we have uh, uh, the first, uh, uh, in 18, um, six, no, 18-something, 18, uh, 18 90 something Fuducli from uh, Arsakion School. She was the first uh, girl ever to register in uh, University of Athens, the math school. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, in 1982, the first uh, full professor, woman full professor, who was Susanna Papadopoulou in University of Crete. She did not make a family. Then we have, uh, I would like to mention the example of uh, my colleague uh, uh, at the Technical University, Christina Fili. She is a historian of mathematics, an amazing scholar. She, Christina, received, uh, like, a few years ago, uh, the Medal Coiré from the French Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences, and she is the first Greek person ever to have received this medal. It is a high very high distinction. Uh, Christina also did not make a family. Uh, then I, I would like to mention very proudly that in 2019, I received an email from an unknown woman to me uh, uh, from Berlin, who asked me if I was uh, uh, willing to accept uh, to represent Greece in an exhibition uh, women of mathematics throughout Europe that uh, uh, was presented like with uh, photography and um, interview. And this exhibition was started in 2016 in European Congress of Mathematics in Berlin uh, with portraits of one woman, woman from each uh, European country, uh, 13 portraits to start with. And then the European Congress of Mathematics takes place every four years. So the next one was in Slovenia. And uh, she asked me, and then they wanted to extend this exhibition, all this work with uh, uh, photography and uh, interviewing. And they made a very nice uh, book out of this. So they wanted to extend this exhibition to countries of Mediterranean shores. So they asked me if uh, I agreed to represent Greece, and of course I agreed for uh, this great honor. Uh, so it's not, uh, uh, okay, these are, let's say, highlights in my mind that I wanted to mention. Now the situation with uh, women in mathematics starts from undergraduate years, and the situation is very good. It's like 45 to 55 uh, uh, percent. It is very good. But then, when they continue with uh, postgraduate studies, they continue with the masters, okay, uh, but then for PhD, reading for PhD, it becomes much, much harder, uh, much fewer continue. And then, not to mention how is the situation in academic jobs. So, gradually they give up because uh, they are more aware, they become gradually aware that they have to make a family. Uh, therefore, they give up, uh, they give up uh, mathematics or their passion for research, let's say, or uh, s seeking an academic job, and uh, they settle to any other, let's say, lower uh, position so that they can handle at the same time having home and family. Uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, assistant professors, associate professors, full professors, and as we go up in rank, the percentage becomes tragically low. So we reach like uh, maybe 7% uh, 
Uh, and I think this is uh, all over the world. It's not only in Greece. Uh, the situation is everywhere like that. A woman that we should mention also, but not from uh, Greece, a famous mathematician, is uh, Maria Mirzakhani, who uh, was an Iranian woman, who was the first person ever from Iran to receive the highest distinction in mathematics, the Fields Medal. So mathematicians do not receive a Fields, uh, do not receive a Nobel Prize because Nobel was very explicit in his. Uh, in his yes, in his heritage, in his heritage. In his, yes, in his heritage. yes. Uh, that no mathematician should ever receive Nobel Prize. I don't know. There are bad uh, that gossip about his wife and mathematician. I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyhow, it is all in the sphere of gossip. Anyhow, so mathematicians receive the Fields Medal and they have to be below 45, whilst uh, the Nobel Prize is any age, and they have to have done some uh, uh, extraordinary contribution uh, in some field of mathematics. So this Maria Mirzakhani, she was uh, 44 when she received uh, the Fields Medal. And uh, then some years later, she died uh, of breast cancer. She had made a family in the States. And um, uh, for uh, honoring her, uh, we have uh, worldwide uh, 12, uh, May 12. It is the day of uh, uh, women in mathematics all over the world. And uh, just for honoring Maria Mirzakhani, it is her birth date. Um, I think most has been heard. Most that was heard applies also for us. Uh, my path has not been so much different uh, because if you have to strive from country to country, from place to place, from research visit to research visit, so it's really very difficult to also settle for a family. And if you do, then you have to remember that there were some, some strict rules about the roles in the family and so on. Of course, my children are the greatest project of my life. Nevertheless, I still have uh, enormous passion. And uh, uh, just to give you a, one personal, uh, one personal, let's say, uh, from my experience, um, a, a witnessing from my experience is that uh, uh, I remember I had to, uh, I could not travel for many years. I could not travel abroad uh, and uh, go participate in conferences. But uh, when I had uh, a research visit, then I decided it was clear to me that I could not leave both children at home. It was impossible because of various issues uh, at home. So uh, when uh, they were four, I have twins. I took my son in the first trip abroad. The next year I took my daughter in a trip abroad. And since then I took them alternatingly. And uh, uh, just as well, they have uh, gained some good experience from uh, staying abroad and uh, being independent also while I do my research. So, uh, and I think this is how um, it is more or less for all women, more or less. I would like to end uh, with a positive uh, uh, remark. I noticed because since November 2021, we started the, uh, the association Greek Women in Mathematics. We did not have it before. Mm -hmm. uh, an ex-student of our department told me, why don't we do this? Why don't you go into uh, as country representative in European Women of Mathematics? So I went in there. We started the Greek Women in Mathematics. So uh, we have a very nice network. Uh, with representatives in all uh, math departments in Greece. And uh, my uh, experience, from what, uh, what I have seen so far, talking to all these younger women, is that, first of all, uh, young, young girls, students, even undergraduates, are very happy with this. I thought that all these issues are, uh, have uh, deceased, uh, that they are not existing anymore in the younger generation. I see that uh, women of like 40, the age of 40, uh, they manage to balance better career and family. The reason 
it's not that they are more able, but it is because uh, men are more aware that this is an equal participation. So, uh, and we cannot have progress in one thing without, uh, uh, I mean, there is a balance, there has to be a balance. So this balance cannot, uh, it has to be pushed from both sides in order support. to remain a balance, exactly. Support. support, exactly. And uh, then, but my big surprise is still that young girls are so thrilled and excited with participating in such uh, kind of events. And the last thing I want to uh, present you is, uh, uh, and of course we are there to, to, to be with them, let's say, and co-organize with them whatever they want. And the last thing uh, I would like to, to mention is that last May, the whole month of May, even from March, uh, uh, we have uh, a team of young, uh, of young students uh, the young minds, uh, and I think they have uh, teams in every university. Uh, so the National Technical University team of young minds organized uh, for the whole month uh, of uh, May uh, uh, very nice lectures of women from various scientific areas, especially STEM areas. Uh, science, technology, education, and mathematics, and uh, with uh, eminent invited speakers and a whole meeting presenting women uh, in uh, careers and discussion about family and all these issues. So I'm very happy that this is vivid, that this comes in discussion, and uh, it looks like uh, the worst things are behind us in the area of mathematics, the very worst. Very well. extreme things are behind us. But, okay, there is the glass ceiling, of course, especially in leadership positions. Okay, we managed to become professors, some, but to talk about vice rectors, rectors, uh, president of the Hellenic Mathematical Society, no, they don't even want to, <laughs> to know us. I mean, they don't, uh, they don't hint to Greek women mathematics. So, so there is still a lot to go for leadership positions, a long, a long way still to go in that direction. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Labrapoulou, for taking the time to outline all these very important issues about how difficult it is for women to rise up that ladder of uh, leadership, especially in academic positions. Um, by the way, I'm actually uh, counting five gentlemen here in this room as we speak, and I uh, have to give them credit for being here today with us, including the mayor of Casos, uh, Mr. Mikhail Serotokritos, who is here with us and honoring this day. Um, it's quite important to have men in this room. It gives us uh, added value, this conference today, because it, you know, we, we are basically on the same front. We all have the same uh, you know, needs and values. So having you here today is very important for us. Thank you. Um, I would, um, it's very important. Oh, yeah, lovely yeah. ladies. Thank you very much. You, you're here all today. Ναι, αλλά δεν είναι αυτό που in this very important conference. I will, I'm very happy that, delighted that you're here. Um, I have to say that Mrs. Ismini Kriari is a distinguished academic known for her contributions to social and political science. Uh, she served as Professor Emeritus at Bandio University of Social and Political Science in Greece, where she also held the position of rector. Um, Mrs. Kriari's research interests include political theory, social policy and gender studies, reflecting her commitment to exploring the complexities of social structures and governance. 
Uh, throughout her career, she has published numerous articles and books, influencing both academic discourse and public policy. Her leadership at Bandia University was marked by a dedication to academic excellence and the promotion of interdisciplinary uh, studies. Thank you for being with us today. I'm sure you have a lot to talk to us about uh, where we are uh, as women today in the academic field together with Ms. Labrapula. I'm sure there's more, more, much more to learn. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Tonya Moropoulou, for her invitation. I will take the, the thread from the point where it was left by the previous speaker, and uh, I will give a few words about uh, the women in the administration of the academia. So, when, if I may give you some uh, of, my, uh, of my comments and uh, of my memories, when I first met uh, Professor Moropoulou, it was in 2011, when I was elected Vice Rector at Pandya University and when I went uh, to the uh, great conference of uh, the Greek rectors and Vice Rectors, I saw Mrs. Moropoulou and I realized that uh, the Vice Rectors we were about seven or eight, among 70 or 75. So uh, that was really um, something that, that gave me a call to shiver because uh, somehow I had imagined that in 2011 there would be more of us, but we were only seven. And what was uh, actually painful was that uh, the National and Capodistrian University uh, had uh, just uh, seven uh, gentlemen uh, representing the university in, in all of the administration. There was no lady, so many lady doctors, so many ladies, uh, lawyers, and uh, in literature and uh, in every possible field, but there was no lady there. And this situation continued, and uh, uh, only one year ago, when uh, the new uh, rectorship was elected in uh, Athens Kapoditsia University, now in 2003, two ladies vice rectors were elected. And uh, after some years, when I was elected rector, it was in 2016, we were only three ladies rectors and uh, 18 gentlemen rectors. So why does it happen? Why is it so difficult and why the numbers are actually somehow discouraging? When I was a candidate, uh, good friends, friends I went out for a drink or to dine or with whom I discussed uh, academic matters and uh, matters concerning the university, they were uh, very positive. Women cannot be elected as rectors. So I said, why? They said, it is so. Women are not elected as rectors in Greece. Don't you look around you? What do you see? What, how many rectors do we have? We have only two. There were excuses for these two. She comes from a very old family. The other has a very influential husband. Uh, if you do not belong to these two categories, women do not get elected as rectors. But um, somehow, in the end, uh, I got a bit stubborn. And I said, OK, I want to see if this hypothesis can be verified uh, in, an, an, in a scientific way. So I give myself to science. And uh, I want uh, to find out if actually this axiom uh, is valid, because uh, I, I don't expect to get elected, but I want to see the reasons. So everybody approached me and told me, well, you know, we are so sympathetic to us, but we are not going to be elected. Why are you running? So I said, I give myself to science. I want to know the reasons and the exact number that I want to be elected. Well, somehow this convinced many people who would not be convinced uh, in the uh, traditional way, and I was elected after all. Just to find out that we were three ladies elected, uh, and uh, uh, for four years it was only three of us. And uh, but there were more vice rectors. In four years, uh, the number seven had been actually developed to about uh, 14, something like that, or 15, which is a huge progress. And. Uh, now, in the last elections, I saw with pleasure and satisfaction that there are more uh, ladies rectors, which is definitely um, as a kind of uh, um, tangible programs. Why? I could venture to give some explanation. Our previous orator has already um, gave all, has already given uh, the majority of the arguments of why this happens. I should try to give you some ideas about uh, two kinds of obstacles. The ones are uh, inside the women's character. It is that uh, inside and invisible 
obstacles which says that uh, you have to do so many things. You have to be a mother, you have to be a wife, you have to be a good scientist, you have to be sometimes better than the man, a man scientist. You have to prove each and every day that you are good, that you deserve that academic position. You have to be innovative. You have to know something that appears yesterday. You have to know it yesterday night. So if you have to do all these things, then why are you, tri are you striving also to get an, an um, uh, administrative position? After all, administrative positions are positions which do not matter in your academic career. So this is one of the obstacles. And the other ob obstacle is uh, actually that there is this glass ceiling uh, um, mentality that uh, this is something that is very, very high and it is invincible. So you don't know how to break it. You don't know what you have to do. How can you prove that you have uh, administrative qualification? How, how can you prove that you can lead? How can you prove that you have ideas? How can you prove that you can inspire? Things that are considered as given for men. Nobody questions if a man who is candidate can lead. Nobody says, well, he cannot lead. Nobody says, oh, how can he inspire? He cannot inspire. No, nobody says that. But for a woman who runs in an office, then she should prove that she can lead. She should prove that she can inspire. She should prove that she is better than men at the same position. So this is really something that... Uh, uh, the mathematical numbers and uh, uh, the uh, clear and um, sometimes objective elements of research cannot touch. We know that they exist, we know that they are there, but uh, we cannot measure them. We feel them, we perceive them, but we cannot measure them because they cannot be measured, because it is that kind of mentality which is installed in the men's minds. And this is for me the issue. The issue is not if women can get administrative positions, if women can be at the head of academic institutions. The issue is if men are ripe enough, if they are mature enough to accept that women can have administrative positions, that women can lead, that women can inspire, that women can have new ideas, and they are in position also to bring them to fulfillment, something which is actually much more difficult because you have to be twice as good. You have to try to convince people who do not want to be convinced. I heard many times that uh, when I ran for these offices that, um, okay, you are good, okay, some people know you, but you know, he and him and him, they are, they are accepted. You are not accepted. So you have to struggle to be accepted, and it's not easy. So uh, this is the situation here. It's getting better. Every year it's getting better. And uh, we have many ladies now that are at the head of academic institutions. Uh, we have also ladies who are uh, not only at, at, at the head of universities, but also at research institutions. For instance, uh, in EKE, our uh, national uh, social science um, research institution is led by a lady. And uh, also in other uh, authorities and in independent bodies, we have also ladies. And um, I am now heading uh, president of the um, Greek Independent Authority for Human Assisted Procreation, and there are also uh, another lady who is head of the authority for the uh, vaccines, and there are other ladies who are in other authorities. No, we are not uh, actually 50-50, uh, but uh, we are about one-third, one-fourth, but we are there, and I hope that uh, more ladies will come and uh, that they might have uh, a bit easier way. And uh, I know that uh, Professor Moropoulou, in her quality as uh, not only as vice rector, but also in her quality as a professional in the field of chemical engineering, she has uh, accomplished so many things in so many fields that I'm sure that uh, she is a role model for the young students of the Polytechnic, that uh, every young girl wishes uh, to be able to do just a portion of his work in the old monuments, in the old churches, in the old architectural treasures which she has accomplished. I know that uh, uh, these figures help us all to see that uh, actually sky is the limit, sky that is a bit far away, but uh, as the Latin says, per aspera ad astra, through small and difficult walks to the stars. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ms. Creati, for talking to us about this very important issue we have uh, here about how very, and um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a common phenomenon actually that, you know, vice rectors, maybe they're underrepresented or they're very few in, in your field and how difficult it is when, um, you know, you have to always prove yourself that you are better than a man who might be also uh, less better than you, but you always have to be up to par for that. Um, having said that, and the uh, last but not very valued guest in the flow um, is uh, basically uh, a very important person in our society. Um, we have the honor to welcome Ms. Sofia Vultepsi, who is the Deputy Minister of Migration and Asylum in Greece. Uh, we all know that she plays a key role in shaping the country's immigration policies and managing asylum processes. With a background in law and public administration, she has been actively involved in addressing complex migration issues and enhancing the legal framework surrounding asylum seekers. Also, Ms. Vultepsi advocates for humane and effective migration policies, emphasizing the importance of integration and support for refugees. And her work focuses on balancing national interests with international obligations, ensuring that Greece meets its commitments to human rights and humanitarian assistance. And having said that, I think it's a very difficult task to be a woman in this role and having to balance, I guess, family and, um, you know, uh, political life. It's not an easy task to do, but I think you have a lot to tell us about that. And also... Um, being in the human rights field and being also part of that diversity that is so important in our country with all the migrants coming in. I'm sure you have met very important people, interesting people that have a lot to talk about having come here in this country and how they feel being so many years and women as well, especially being here and trying to survive and make a better life for themselves. So I'm sure you have a lot to talk about. Thank you, dear colleague. You know, the same is for journalism also. The last time I went to Bosnia, my children were uh, three and uh, seven years old, and I brought them to my mother's house and said, the plane is leaving for Bosnia. And she said, no, where are you going now? This must finish. Now you have children. What are you, am I going to do with these orphans? <laughs> and I say, they are not orphans. Actually, yet, but I'm here. I told her, and she was, uh, you know, she was showing her the children, saying, "These orphans." <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for inviting me, dear Tonya Moropoulou, uh, who, okay, she is an important personality, uh, who gave and continues to to give fights for freedom, democracy, and equality. And of course, and of whose action, Tonya's action, we're all proud. The theme that Tonya chose for this forum is to highlight the strength and the, living, the leading role of women in relation to the key issues of the economy and sustainable development. We are now in the third decade of 21st century, and despite significant achievements, we heard of the, some of them, research has shown that the women's issue is in the first 20 years of this century has remained at a standstill. And for women, stagnation means regression. The causes are many but women would have overcome all stereotypes if we had succeeded in reconciling work and family life, which is still the issue. One of the start latest surveys showed that in Greece, the care of children and relatives mainly concerns women. While we don't achieve the obvious, other research shows that women possess distinct intellectual and moral skills. Hardworking, they are communicative, insightful, patient, less competitive, 
but more understanding and able to identify and solve problems. When they hold managerial positions or are active in the business world, they increase the profitability of the enterprises for which they are responsible. 25 years ago, when the great global financial crisis broke out, the phrase first heard was, if Lehman Brothers had been called Lehman Sisters, it would not have gone bankrupt. It was the phrase that became synonymous with female entrepreneurship, the contribution of women to the development of the economy, and the emergence of female skills in a field that even today is considered a male stronghold. A study by consulting firm McKinsey found that European companies with more women saw their average share value rise by 47%. It was also found that during the financial crisis, companies with female managers saw a smaller decline in stock markets. However, 25 years later, in our world, almost 3 billion women do not have equal professional opportunities with men. Equality has reached almost 100% in the education and health sectors, but the pay gap persists, and despite the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, violence against women remains a major problem. In 2019, we were told that globally it would take 150 years to achieve full employment equality between men and women, and at European level, 54 years, more than a half a century. Shocking, really, to have more graduates and fewer, fewer workers. In 2020, things changed to worse. We have been informed that in its annual report on equality in the world, the World Economic Forum has recorded improvements in all areas except labor. And the 170 years became instantly 257. And to have a full equality overall in all areas from 108 years, we have fallen just to 19 9.5. That is in one century. That is one century. And all this, even though, according to studies by all international organizations and the EU, world GDP would increase dramatically if women with their great qualities were able to show their skills in business. What are these virtues? Discipline, organization, social sensitivity, sense of duty, responsibility, hard work, creativity, inspiration, and especially the need to constantly bleed in the battle of the obvious and work double and triple to prove the obvious. Let me tell you here that the gifts of women were codified by Plutarchos, the greatest feminist of antiquity. In his work, Women of Virtue, which I must also tell you that in our country, Greece, remains his most unknown work. It is easy to understand why. <laughs> According to Plutarch, feminine virtues are bravery, decency, solidarity between women, prudence, initiative, and government capacity. He ever made special reference to the power and influence that women's good conduct expert exerts on men. According to the research of the Athens University of Economics and Business, women business executives are not risky in making and executing decisions. They do not seek the satisfaction of the I, me, through professional advancement, they have humanitarian criteria in their assessments, and they are characterized by understanding 
and willingness to compromise the bridge different opinions. Despite progress in the proportion of women in senior management positions worldwide, growth is slowing internationally, uh, pointing to persistent barriers and challenges that hinder women's advancement to senior management positions. This year, on International Women's Day, a series of surveys showed that more women hold high positions in business, but inequalities persist as men remain in leadership roles. In Greece, the share of women in senior management positions fell by five percentage points in 2024 to 32% compared to, third, uh, I, I mean, 32% um, compared to 37% the previous year. Overall, of course, since 2004, the relative percentage was increased by 10 percentage points. But we don't just fight in the business world. Our world continues to move forward without having all its engines on and without using the skills and abilities of all its human resources in all areas. A long road from darkness to light, a long journey that continues, has always been the struggle of women. My experience has been unique. I was fortunate and at the same time unfortunate to become the first female government representative spokesperson in my country. What happened and what accompanied this first is proof that this game is not played on equal terms. It turned out that the path of fierce political confrontation becomes even more painful and uphill depending on the gender to which the target of the attacks belongs. A man who reaches a high, a high office is attacked, but these are political or at least related to some personal characteristics, but this is not the, the, the personal element that uh, somebody makes focus. But a woman, oh, a woman is an easy weak link a target that can easily be mocked, ridiculed, commented on based on her dress, her style, height, and weight. And some people always make sure to find in them disadvantages that for men are not existent. She's very beautiful. She's very young. She's very smart. She's very old. She wears very high heels and other similar jokes. Does all this matter? I can assure you that none. Because those who choose this way of neutralizing their political opponent, this way of killing a woman in high office, do not consider something very simple. To get there, a woman has already gone through 40 waves, already fought and bled in other great battles, before reaching the mother of the battles. I mean, when you decide to kill a woman, you must consider that in order for her to reach a stand in front of your target, she has previously run between bullets, bullets countless times and been saved. And the biggest women's battle is against distractions. As Simone de Beauvoir, the author of The Second Sex, which became the Bible of the women's movement, used to say, at any time of the day, the husband or the children may ask her for an explanation, some help, a service, and she is obliged to satisfy their wishes immediately. Beauvoir also gave the di diagnosis. Women are obliged to expend so much energy and exhaust all their reserves of courage to free themselves from exter external distractions, constantly proving the obvious that they arrive exhausted from overexertion to the point where men are just beginning. In other words, the starting point between men and women is different. 
The great writer Virginia Woolf said, imagine if in Shakespeare's place was an equally gifted baby girl. It would achieve nothing. She would stay at home, learn to cook, shoe, have children. It is impossible to imagine that she would study the same as Shakespeare, that she would become an actress and play writer. Shakespeare would never exist. And Stendhal, that great feminist, even genius born in a woman's body is lost, every, sorry, every genius born in a woman's body is lost to humanity. There is, of course, good news. Women elsewhere, everywhere have attained top positions, presidents, chancellors, prime ministers, ministers in important ministries, presidents of parliaments, presidents of parties, presidents of major educational institutions, heads and representatives of international organizations, directors of historical newspapers, heads of secret services. Many countries dare to put women in, in charge of defense ministries, but also in charge institutions such as the Securities and Exchange Commissions. In recent years, many countries have achieved absolute equality in their cabinets with the presence of an equal number of men and women. In Greece, too, we have made some progress. We are not in the same place where our grandmothers and even our mothers were. These advantages, however, are not worthy of the contribution of Greek women uh, to the nation. We must understand, men and women, that we must not lose this battle, because Greek women have proven their abilities and skills. They have also proven their patriotism. Consider that Greek women took part in all the struggles of the nation, from the struggle of the rebirth to Macedonia struggle, and the epic of 1940, without even having the right to vote. There is a story that I like to tell every time I talk about Greek women. As we know, women received the right to vote and stand as candidates in national elections in 1952. But they still did not vote because their names had not been entered on the electoral roll. They voted in the local by-election of Thessaloniki when the first Greek MP, Elenis Kura, was elected. Shortly afterwards, Greece acquired its first minister, Lina Salvari. There is also an, history, an interesting historical background there. The by-election in Thessaloniki was triggered on December 7, 1952, when an MP of the rally suddenly died of cardiac arrest. And the elections in which women were invited to take part for the first time were to fill this position in 1953. The way for the first female nomination had been clear. The and five women rushed to try their luck. Eleni Skura of the um, uh, National uh, Alarm, let's say, Virginia Zana of EPEC, and the independents Meropi Vasilikou, Stavrula Kostopoulou, and Angeliki Tsakona. In other words, the two major parties, led by Papagos and Plastiras, decided to nominate two women as candidates unique candidates, so they could not vote for somebody else. They basically decided that a woman wouldn't enter the parliament, that the world would be spoiled. And it broke down. The male establishment revolted. An important member of the government faction, named Aidonas, reacted first and declared that he would run with the rally. Marshal Papagos denounced him and expelled him. The same applies to the Greek center. There, another executive named, named Anoyanakis revolted. In turn, Plastiras denounced him telegraphically from America where he was. Either the women or us was the common slogan of the men of the two factions who for the first time had decided to unite. They were killing them, themselves in the streets. 
and they were un united, as soon as one woman decided to get in the parliament. More than 20 years later, Virginia Chuderu was elected MP in the first election after the fall of the dictatorship of the colonels. On the day of the inauguration, she arrived at the house and tried to enter the plenary chamber. But the policeman blocked her way. Wives and other relatives upstairs in the gallery, he told her. But I am an MP, Virginia replied. Please, ma'am, do not insist. Head to the gallery. <laughs> the policeman replied urgently. But the men of her own party, they told her, they told her of Virginia, as she described in her work when the, the, the walls fall, treated her in a, in a really not very successful way. You will decorate our group with your presence, they told her, while she did not want to decorate anything. She just wanted to bring down the walls. These walls that even today still rise in front of all women. Now, however, we have another mission, to bring the new glass ceiling, the one between very successful and recognized women and those who remain low, even though they are qualified. Together, we will continue the fight against the prejudices that keep women stuck in female positions because the struggle of Greek women for liberation comes from far away. From, from the first Greek novelist, Alexandra Papadopoulou, who in 1887 published The Diary of the Ladies. Stavros Voutiras, very, very well-known writer, wrote about it. Leave aside progressive associations and protests and paradoxical principles and ideas about the emancipation of women. Go into the domestic economy and there your attention is drawn to it. For, women, for the woman was born for the home, while the man was born for science and society. The struggle of Greek women for emancipation also comes from the conflict of Kaliroi Paren with the male establishment of her time, whose attack she was, who she was attacked when she published the ladies' newspaper. The newspaper of Paren was satirized by, the, by another writer, Emanuel Roidis, and uh, it resulted to a journalistic war between them. He ironically called her an apostle of women's emancipation in Greece, and she replied that the title of apostle of female emancipation is a noble title which Plato and Christ aspired to, among others. Arsinoi Papadopoulou, who clashed with the male establishment of the time, who in 1896 dared to publish her short stories only to receive harsh criticism, again from Roides, who wrote that a woman thinking and writing as a man violates the, her gender, becomes a male woman. I will finish with another story personal this time. In May 2014, my son Giannis, now a lawyer, seeing that because of my duties as a parliamentary spokeswoman, I, go, I was constantly going back and forth a mommy promise, appeared with a page from my notebook. Above and above the brand New Democracy, parliamentary spokesperson. Underneath, Giannis had written, I, the bearer of the above title, Sofia Vultepsi, declare responsibly and with free will that by June 21, 2014, I will have responded and uh, he wanted something. To get rid of him, I signed and he stuck my statement on the fridge. <laughs> In the meaning, however, the reshuffle took place I became a minister and became government spokesperson, the first female spokesperson, with all the consequences of this that you, you will all remember. The note stayed there and the deadline passed without action. 
No one paid attention to the note on the fridge anymore. I would leave at dawn and return after midnight. One evening, passing in front of the refrigerator, I stood, st I stood still. Something had been added to my old faded statement. Yanis had added the phrase, Mrs. Vultepsi invoked an unexpected change of circumstances. <coughs> Sorry, and in brackets, the reference to the Article 388 of the Civil Code. <laughs> it was one of the rare times I was pardoned. You know, a lot of people think that women like us don't have a problem. Let me inform you that we have normal spouses and normal children, so understand. For symbolic reasons, that note has been kept, be has been kept between our, uh, let's say, heirloom. To my family, relatives, and friends, who even today, 10 years after the first time government spoke person, they ask me, how did you endure? I answer, on a personal level, because there are all of you. To a politician, because in every difficulty in my mind always comes the famous phrase of Margaret Thatcher, who although an iron lady was often in the crosshairs of criticism because of her gender. Margaret Thatcher said, if and on Thames, even if you see me walking on the Thames, you will accuse me of not knowing how to swim. Dear friends, now we have another battle to fight. I told you before, it's the fight of breaking this new glass ceiling. And we have to do it. It is the mission of women who have reached at, the, at this point to help other women, to fight together with other women. That is to become the role models that will inspire the next generations of women and help them follow in their footsteps. And this struggle, in my opinion, at, is at the basis of the idea of Tonya Moroboulou and her collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wildipsy. It always brings me to think that we all have a member, a male member in our family who is uh, intelligent, uh, witful, and, you know, maybe not be sticking messages on a fridge, but still, you know, um, has uh, a lot of personality and a lot of value for women, because we have to realize that even a lot of men, they do come from the same wound, which is a female wound, before they actually grow up and become men themselves. And having said that, I would, have, I would be delighted to pass you the flow for questions, and I will be even more delighted to have the male population here in this room asking questions, if possible. Thank you. Okay, no male, no one wants to talk about, okay, who would like to ask any questions about what our fellow speakers spoke about today? No? Nope. Everything, Everything was clear, precise. They all agreed. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, Thank you very much. Well, I need um, just to wrap up before we actually um, end this wonderful conference about how important it is for equality between the two, um, let's say, the two genders. It's also mm -hmm. important to, I mean, I always remember this book, um, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, and I always tend to wonder how true that is. However, we are different species, but we are very similar in so many different ways. Um, I, from all 
the things that our fellow speakers spoke about, I will stick to some points which were which really stuck stuck in me. Um, Mrs. Bafataki, for example, said that the balancing of career and family is a societal challenge and that women require adaptive strategies with flexible policies. Maybe that's a solution to um, becoming more um, you know, seen and uh, heard. And also, I remember you saying that countries with maternity and paternity policies are key in providing women with leadership roles. I will stick to what Mrs. Ismini Hrisikopoulou said, that by investing in the development of women judges, we are not merely promoting gender equality. We are ensuring that justice is served through diverse perspectives and inclusive representation. And what is very important is also what Mrs. Sofia Labropoulou said, that um, it's very difficult once women uh, think differently, because when they think differently, they are more or less outcast. We've seen that in different periods of history, um, and we also see that, that when they go into their postgraduate degrees and PhD, they find obstacles become harder in academic posts, yet um, it's a challenge when you're traveling and you're a parent and becomes more difficult. However, we still struggle and we still aim for becoming better how, no matter what that difficulty is, okay? And that's the road, it's hard, but it's worthwhile um, going through that road. Mrs. Mini Criari, vice rectors were only seven women. Am I right? Is that what you just uh, said? And how difficult it is for women to be elected as rectors? Um, women are always called to prove that they're capable and able to perform tasks even when they are better. And sometimes you have to be twice as good to convince people who do not want to be convinced. That is a very key point to remember when we are struggling to prove that we can do the job better. And what can I say about Ms. Wultepsi? Um, I will always keep that message on the fridge in my head, remembering that even, you know, if your son is such a clever man and has actually, I don't know that particular penal code there or that code uh, in the law, but I think that, you know, is a very nice internal conversation that you might be having also not then but years after that talking about you know how you know communication can be done in so many different ways and that's your inner code there so I'll keep that thank you very much for being here today I hope you had fun did you and thank you, Mrs. Maropoulou, for giving me the opportunity to present this conference. Thank you. Professor Maropoulou, thank you very much for the invitation.